Paraphrased from the William Livingston Papers, Volume 4, available at the Library of Congress. For the rest of the Revolution, militia and state troops drawn from the militia disarmed local Tories, battled loyalists, and British raiders all along the coast, from New Jersey's aquatic border with New York all the way south deep into the Pine Barrens. New Jersey militiamen also conducted amphibious raids and attacks on British coastal enclaves and their shipping. As well, the militia also assisted regular American forces in large battles like Monmouth Courthouse. Many battles and skirmishes were fought in New Jersey, which gained the state the nickname Cockpit of the Revolution. New Jersey also later in the war enlisted militiamen into special units of state troops, which were militia units in longer terms of service, usually one year, but some were three, six, or nine months. These served along the frontiers and borders of the state where action by the enemy was frequent, such as Bergen, Monmouth, and around Elizabethtown to Perth Amboy. Dear Sirs, There are a few occasions when life presents us with an ultimatum, a choice to take a stand and effect a contagious change. My vote for independence as a delegate to the Continental Congress was not cast lightly, for the cause of liberty was halted at a crossroad and offered but two directions. The first was to continue on as if no choice had been offered. But the second was to take the opportunity thrust upon us and proclaim to the world that we are free men. You may have my son in your custody. One day you may have myself sitting in your prison. But I have offered everything to the cause of my countrymen. I have accepted liberty's ultimatum, so you will never hear me recant. Sincerely, Abraham Clark. Abraham Clark's response to the British Crown leveraging his captive son, Thomas, an artillery officer that was being held by the 14th Regiment Foot in Pennsylvania. General Clinton, in regards to how the War of Rebellion should be fought. To gain the hearts and subdue the minds of America. General Clinton, on how the war should be fought in America. Sir Henry Clinton was very sarcastic when speaking about Lord Cornwallis and referred to him as the Noble Earl meaning he believed him pompous and indignant. I have the pleasure to assure you, Congress paid particular attention to the defense of New Jersey, and hitherto have denied us nothing which we have asked for that purpose. Abram Clark, 2nd Continental Congressman from Elizabethtown, Essex County, New Jersey. When dealing with the militia of New Jersey, Hessian officer Johann Ewald wrote in his book, Diary of the American War, a Hessian journal. What can you not achieve with such small bands who have learned to fight, dispersed, who know how to use every molehill for the defense, and who retreat as quickly when attacked as they advance again, and who will always find space to hide? Never have I seen these maneuvers performed better than by the American militia, and especially that of the province of New Jersey. If you were forced to retreat against these people, you could certainly count on constantly having them around you. Captain Johann Ewald on fighting in the Northern Hornets list. Sir, I have seen the enemy. Though in view I evaluate are above 3,000, there may be, and probably enough, are others out of fight. They have sent over their horse to the other side, except about 50 or supply. Their baggage, it is agreed on all hands, has been also sent across, and they're wounded. It is not ascertained that any of their infantry have path to the other side. There are four or 500 on the opposite point, but it is uncertain whether they are those who went from this side or those who were on Staten Island. I rather suppose the former. Different conjectures may be made. The present movement may be calculated to draw us down and betray us into an action. They may have drafted from their intention of sailing last night for fear of our falling upon their rear. I believe this is the case. For as they had but few goals, it would certainly be a delicate maneuver to cross in our faces. We are taking measures to watch their motion tonight, 
as closely as possible. An insufficient but very light skirmishing, very few boats, not more than enough to carry their 400 men at a time. It is likely more will come down this evening. I have the honor to be Your Excellency's most obedient servant, Alexander Hamilton, from Halstead Point, June 8th, 1780. Maxwell wrote, Our parties of continental troops and militia at the defile performed wonders. After stopping the advance of the enemy near three hours, they crossed over the defile and drove them to the tavern that was Jeremiah Smith's. But the enemy were at that time reinforced with at least 1,500 men, and our people were driven in their turn over the defile and obliged to quit it. I, with the whole brigade and militia, was formed to attack them, but it was thought imprudent as the ground was not advantageous and an enemy very numerous. We retired slowly toward the heights, toward Springfield, harassing them on their right and left till they came with their advance to David Meaner's house, where they thought proper to halt. Shortly after the whole brigade with the militia advanced their right, left and front with the greatest rapidity and drove their advance to the main body. We were in turn obliged to retire after the closest action I have seen this war. We were then pushed over the bridge at Springfield, where we posted some troops and with the assistance of a field piece, commanded by the militia, the enemy were again driven back to their former station, and still further before night. Never did troops, either continental or militia, perform better than ours did. In Thomas Fleming's 1973, book, The Forgotten Victory, The Battle for New Jersey, 1780, he recounts Abigail Lennington, the Caldwell's maid's statement on what had transpired, quoting Fleming's book. Nervously expecting trouble, the light infantryman approached the window, his finger on the trigger. Abigail Lennington shrank back, pulling the little boy with her. Probably the soldier caught a glimpse of her as she moved away from the window. It was a bright sunny day and it seemed doubtful that the man standing several feet away from the window could see very far into the room that had no windows in three walls. But a movement, any movement, was all this jittery man needed to see. He fired his double loaded musket through the window and both bullets struck Mrs. Caldwell. Moments later, more British troops arrived, breaking down the door, looting the house and checking Mrs. Caldwell's body for jewelry. In an earlier video, we made note of extensive damage inflicted on the citizenry of New Jersey by the British military. See our truth about Colonial Linden Extra, the sack of Westfield. As in almost every instance, property damage claims were filed by private citizens. After the Battle of Connecticut Farms, there was a break from the norm. Identified in an article blogged on the site, thewayofimprovement.com, writer Dr. John Fay brings to light a specific claim of damages made by the entire Presbyterian parish at Connecticut Farms. The claim consisted of all the community resources that then were provided by the church at Connecticut Farms. It reads as such, damage claim number 22, made at Connecticut Farms at May 28, 1789 for damage done on June 7, 1780. Items, one large well-finished meeting house burnt, 1,500 pounds. One bell, 65 pounds. 
One large Bible, one pound, ten shillings. One velvet cushion for the pulpit, two pounds. Parsonage house, 40 by 24, 250 pounds. One barn, 24 by 24, 30 pounds. Chair house, 10 pounds. Schoolhouse, 15 pounds. Sundry sacramental vessels, one large silver cup, six pounds. Two large black tin cups, 10 pounds. Two large pewter platters, one pound, four shillings. One basin, three shillings. One fine diaper tablecloth, 16 shillings. And cloth used at buryings, three pounds for a total of 1,885 pounds, three shillings. Now, thousands of men who reached Galveston Hill Bridge first consisted of Queens Rangers, still vigorous from the early morning action, and the fearsome Royalist troops, the New Jersey Volunteers, who had developed a reputation for brutal and total war. This behavior surely was the result of the confiscation of their lands after the British were expelled from New Jersey earlier in the conflict. This animosity would show later in the battle. The two-pronged British attack made its way to the first two bridges, with Nyfaustan's Hessian troops taking fire from Dayton's regulars and militia along the route from Connecticut Farms, before meeting Engels' Rhode Islanders entrenched in Springfield behind the dismantled first Galloping Hill Bridge. Captain Sipko devised a plan to dislodge the guerrillas along the road by taking his rangers north towards Vauxhall to collapse their left flank. This maneuver was initially blocked by Ogden's militia. Simcoe made a decisive move, turning his men to catch some Americans between him and the Greens. When this happened, Simcoe's rangers were able to outflank the initial defense of some of Ogden's militia and at least two of Dayton's regulars, capturing 12 Patriots, and the call for retreat was given to the Americans. Dayton and the New Jersey militiamen withdrew from the apple orchards along the road into the brush, wading across the Rawway River under tree cover and reamassing behind Angle. The fighting was most fierce at this point of the battle, with Angle's Rhode Islanders putting up stiff resistance that would last for most of the day. Dislodging Angle took far longer than necessity demanded. It wasn't until a unit of Chachin Yeagers decided to wade across the Raleigh River that the British forces on the southern prong were able to cross the Raleigh. Untimely for the Americans, as Hessian units poured across and fighting became even more intense, the Patriots began to run low on cartridge for their muskets. Though the Continentals had plenty of powder and ball, without paper, they wouldn't be able to ram the ordnance down and create the necessary pressure to fire. Give them watts, boys. Give them watts. Common hymnal books in the Elizabethtown area were printed by a publisher named Watts. The Patriot line now had the proper paper for cartridge to continue the fight. The Reverend whipped up the morale. Rhode Islanders suffered the largest continental casualties of the battle, with some sources claiming close to 30 killed and 50 wounded were missing. This historic stand by the second Rhode Island bought time and enabled Green to retain all the principal ground in order to, to defend any further advancement through Springfield. However, the town center was ceded to the crown. When Colonel Matthews' a column arrived at Vauxhall with Colonel Barton and the New Jersey Volunteers, they were able to dislodge Lee and Ogden, but it seems that the quicker fallback was either part of a greater tactical plan to secure the American strategy, or that the tactical plan accounted for at least one of the crossings to be breached. The evidence for this is shown through examining a few of the occurrences. First one, Stark's troops with the cannonade upon Short Hills was ready to rain fire down upon Matthews' men in the area they had just crossed into. Faced with being sitting ducks, Matthew and Barton would have to cross the second bridge immediately and attack that position at Short Hills. The second, as Lee and Ogden vacated the lowlands between the branches of the river, they deployed to Short Hills, replacing Maxwell's troops as the Jersey line wheeled down from Short Hills to take position further west at the foot of a bluff by Bryant's Tavern. This would have endangered the British colonel's uh, forces from being attacked on two sides or surrounded by the ghost of Washington's force, whose position was unknown to Colonel Matthew. Washington's force wasn't on the other side of Newark Mountain. However, as the British engaged crossing the first and second bridge, signal fires on the two peaks were active. They continued relaying signals, making the Northern Column's leadership believe this was a planned envelopment. With no other prudent course of action, Colonel Matthew and Colonel Barton crossed back over the second Valsall's Ridge and began to march down along the river to link up with Nyfausen in the town now. With the entire force amassing on the town, it stands evident that the staunch resistance inside Springfield by Angle and some militia evacuated that position at the right time. 
The Americans gave up the easternmost part of the town, but not the field, thus retaining all the highland, allowing for only one access point for the British to continue a march into. This next battlefield would be surrounded by Patriot-held hills and leaving only a narrow pass which restricted movement by the Crown, negating the superior numbers of the expeditionary force. Upon Matthew's column reaching Nyfausen on Galloping Hill Road, Nyfausen ordered Matthew to attack the heights above Springfield where Green had stationed artillery. When the initial attack had failed, Nyfausen, weary of the amount of troops surrounding them from other hills around the pass, knowing that he would have to take every hill one by one, thus sustain uneven amounts of casualties, correctly halted the advance. In anger and frustration, the British set to annihilate the area of town which they controlled. The Loyalists, looting and burning most of Springfield between the Roy branches, with the exception of four houses known to be Loyalist sympathizers, and the now famous Cannonball House, which would be used as a red coat field hospital. After the battle, General Washington wrote to Rhode Island Governor William Green about Colonel Angel's Rhode Island Regiment. The gallant behavior of Colonel Angel's regiment on the 23rd of June at Springfield reflects the highest honor upon the officers and men. They disputed an important pass with so obstinate a bravery that they lost upwards of 40 in killed, wounded and missing before they gave up their ground to a vast superiority of force. The ready and ample manner in which your state has complied with the requisitions of the Committee of Cooperation, both as to men and supplies, entitles her to the thanks of the public and affords the highest satisfaction to Sir, Your Excellency's most obedient servant, George Washington. Artillery officer Major Samuel Shaw stated, after the Battle of Springfield. Nothing could surpass the spirit with which the militia turned out. It was Lexington repeated. This message from General Washington was written on June 25th, 1780, in regards to the militia of New Jersey. The enemy have not made their incursions into this state without loss. Ours has been small. The militia deserves everything that could be said on both occasions. They flew to arms universally and acted with the spirit equal to anything I have seen in the course of the war. General Washington, June 25th, 1780. From a Hessian journal of the Jaeger Corps, August 18th, 1780. It is almost impossible to surprise the enemy on any occasion because every house that one passes is an advanced picket, so to speak, for the farmer or his son or a servant or even his wife and daughter fires off a gun or runs by footpath to warn the enemy. Taken from an entry in the MS Journal of Hessian Soldier from the Jaeger Corps, August 18th, 1780. Three months after the failed invasion of New Jersey, the head of Clinton's intelligence office, Major John Andre, was hung after being captured in a plot between General Arnold and himself to cede West Point to the British. Major Andre was hung as a spy at Tappan, New York on October 2nd, 1780. Mourned by friend and foe alike, he met his fate honorably. His final words were, I pray that you bear me witness that I may meet my fate like a brave man.